Okay, I'll plug in my power supply. And we're drawing zero amps instead of overload amps this time. That's a good sign. Try the power switch and hope for the best. And again, it is working. 113 volts. Don't know how long it'll work, but let's find out. 40 watt light bulb draws 4 amps. 100 watt light bulb that fried it last time. It's drawing 8 amps. Very good. Let's try a couple of light bulbs now. 15 amps. 3 lights. Voltage is nice and steady. 22 amps. And I think I'm just going to let this run for a little while and see if anything gets unusually hot. Because everything should be heat synced properly now. Hmm. I'm going to set this camera down so I can figure out what's getting hot down there. Well, it ran a 300 watt load for 10 minutes or so, and nothing got especially hot. There is something down here that gets quite warm. I'm not sure if the drive FET, there's one, there's two FETs, one for each bank of uh, transistors over here in the boost circuit. I don't know if one of those is slightly damaged and getting warmer than it should be, but the warmth of that one doesn't depend on load, and it seems to work fine, so I'm just going to leave it alone. That's probably how it always was. I don't know. I would need an actual uh, FLIR camera, something that takes a, a thermal uh, picture of it to really know what's getting hot for sure. I don't want to stick my finger on it and burn my finger, it's not worth it. So I'm going to clean this whole thing up, put it back together, and we'll look at it when it's finished. This is the inside of the 2200 watt model, by the way. I thought I would quick show you what this one looks like. It looks just about the same, except they added these two heat sinks to the uh, edge of this. Otherwise, it doesn't really look like they upgraded any of the components inside. It's just the same thing. Uh, I'm not impressed at all. This choke is not broken off on this one, but it is very loose. And it, uh, the glue at least is broken off and it's just being held on by the solder joints. Very poor construction. And down here, if you can see it, there used to be a component here that apparently fell off the board or something. I don't know where it went. There's no way for it to get out of this case. There's no hole big enough for it, so it probably just was never included from the factory, I imagine. A defect that made it past their screening process, probably because they have none, given the quality of the rest of this in here. Again, a very poor quality product. I am... <laughs> this is uh, impressively bad, just like the other one. Anyway, I did notice on this one that uh, right away that the input transistors over here are fried. Probably because they're pushing these too hard, they just bolted on a bigger heatsink and didn't upgrade them. Anyway, I'm gonna have to disassemble it and see if I can get at those transistors. I should note that this component that is missing is just a film capacitor. It's for smoothing the output waveform. Without it, the inverter will still work just fine. It'll just be a little bit noisier. If that is a problem for the user, they can just add a line filter. A lot of sine wave inverters are noisy because it costs money to make them quiet. All you have to do is add a line filter for 10 bucks or so and that solves your problem. Instead, most people like to complain about it. Uh, I took off that auxiliary heat sink up here and now you can see in here a little bit better and uh, looks like a lot of these transistors are very fried. Broken open, magic smoke came out. Looks like there's some circuit board damage down there, but it all looks repairable. And after the repair, it should be reliable again. I can't see the bottom of the circuit board, but I have no reason to believe that there's any major damage. It's interesting to note that the fuses over here... Eh, you can't really see them. There's fuses over here. There they are. There's 320 amps, I think, of fuses, and those did not blow. The input voltage is shorted. So it kind of makes me wonder what happened to the guy's battery when this went. His... Maybe once it started smoking, he immediately disconnected it. Not sure. Anyway, I'll have to disassemble it, fur disassemble it further and 
get at these transistors. Here's the bottom of the circuit board. This is the row of FETs that are bad. Every single one of them is bad, all 12 of them. If you're going to buy these onesies on the internet, it's probably going to cost you three to five bucks a piece plus shipping. So it's not completely cheap. All of these output transistors over here are fine. So I should just have to replace these. It looks like the drive circuit is all right also. I'll have to check that once these are removed because these short everything out. But looks like it's probably repairable. And I'm happy to say that the circuit board is just fine on this side. It's only the, uh, the underside that I can't show you right now that has a problem. I cleaned the circuit board up, removed all the transistors, tried to remove some of the solder from the holes. Uh, I used uh, isopropyl alcohol to clean it up. It cleaned up pretty well, and you can see that there is very little damage to the printed circuit board. It won't be a problem to repair this one at all. And as I showed, the bottom of the circuit board is perfectly fine yet. So once I get, uh, get to putting these transistors in, the question is which ones do I put in? I happen to have uh, a couple different ones here. Um, these are a Fairchild product, FDP 47 n 8 It's not really the right transistor to put in here. Uh, the ones that came out were, uh, let's see, International Rectifier, IRF 3205. That's a really common transistor for the input stage, boost stage of these inverters. But unfortunately, I only have 10 of these, and it requires 12. So I have another one, a really old sample from more than 10 years ago, it, well, yeah, more than 10 years ago now. But uh, they're old International Rectifier IRF 3808s. They're a pretty good match for these Fairchild FETs. And they should actually be a little bit more efficient at high loads than the transistors that were in here. They're a little bit more expensive FETs. Uh, but uh, they do have some higher switching losses, so they may be a little less efficient at low loads. I don't know, I'm going to put them in. Maybe they'll just blow up because the drive circuit isn't any good anyway. Who knows? After all, it did fry in the first place for some reason, and I don't know what that reason is. Maybe it was an over-voltage condition, but just looking at the construction of this inverter, I'm pretty sure they fried simply because the design is not adequate for 2200 watts. Um, this really is very iffy, having just these few FETs for 2200 watts. Now, I should also mention, I've been poo-pooing this inverter a lot. This one and the other one, the 1500 watt one, and I really should be fair to it. It's not terrible. The only reason I don't like it is because it costs too much for what it is. But there are good things to say about it. The capacitors that are in here, uh, for example on the input you get this giant row of input capacitors. There's quite a few of them there. They didn't cheap out on the number of caps. They did on the brand, that's a separate issue. There are 105 C caps. A lot of the very cheap inverters put in 85C caps. Uh, these are uh, glycol-based capacitors. They're minus 40C rather than minus 55, so they won't work in really cold environments, but very few people care about that anyway. They did put, go through the effort of putting some sort of hot glue type substance on all of these connectors in here, which is good. They did put down some sort of caulking for vibration resistance. They didn't do an adequate job, but at least they put some thought into it. This over here, this one is actually zip tied down on this one, so it's not just floating around. The glue is long ago broken, but at least the zip tie is holding it in place. So it's not like they completely forgot to tie it down. The printed circuit board in here has been put together with an automated assembly process. They pretty well have to on sine wave inverters because there's enough components and nobody would want to hand solder this much stuff, even if it is in a very low cost region. But it is an automated assembly, which is good. <clears throat> The case of the inverter is, uh, I don't have the whole case here, but it's a pretty solid case. Once it's all together, it's not going to get damaged very easily. I do like the way that that's put together. The printed circuit board is tied down to the bottom plate well. They put some thought into how it heat sinks. These heat sinks on the sides heat sink not only just to the, uh, to the air that flows through the box, but also to this plate, the stamped steel plate on the bottom, which was, was a good thought. They put thermal compound here too. They didn't have to do that, but I'm glad that they did. That helps quite a bit, actually, heat sinking to this bottom plate. And I like the way that the air flows through it. These fans are obviously temperature and or load controlled because they're not dirty at all, even though this ver inverter is used. So there are some good things to say about it, but overall, I'm just going to try to fix these, and then we're going to see how they perform. 
Maybe they perform outstanding, I doubt it, but maybe. And uh, then some of my concerns are maybe not so severe because it performs well. However, I still say that the construction quality is not what it should be for a $500 inverter. I've taken apart power bright inverters, just standard consumer grade power bright inverters that are modified sine wave, and those really are pretty decent. I didn't have any complaints about them, mainly because it's a, for example, a 6,000 watt inverter could be had for the same price as this one. And for that reason, I didn't really have any complaints because you got what you paid for. In this one, you don't. <clears throat> I also want to mention briefly that the difference between modified sine and sine wave inverters in terms of the components that go into them, the real costs involved are very insignificant. It's just a matter of not many people want to pay the small premium for a sine wave inverter, so not many of these sine wave ones are sold, and therefore they have to be more expensive to make up for it. It's really unfortunate that consumers aren't more educated, because then every inverter would be sine wave, and they'd be almost the same price as what we pay for modified sine wave today. But it's not really the company's fault, it's the consumer's fault, as it usually is in a free market. But all, almost all of the components are the same. We have the input boost stage, which is exactly identical to a modified sine wave inverter, with one exception, and that exception is that it's a slightly higher voltage. It dumps them into these output capacitors over here. They have three of them, which is nice. Some lesser ones would only have two. But uh, into these capacitors over here, these are 250 volt capacitors, modified sine wave, they might cheap out and just put a 200 volt cap there because it's a lower voltage. But all of this stuff here, the fuses, this input stage, these transformers, the output, the smoothing choke, uh, boost choke, go into the output caps, all of that is completely identical to modified sine wave. None of this is more expensive. It's the same. Now on the output side, you have these transistors that are down underneath here, you can't really see them, but they're there. They again are identical to a modified sine wave inverter. There is no cost difference there whatsoever. They still require heat sinking just the same, fan cooling just the same, a stamped steel case just the same, or extruded aluminum case just the same. The cabling inside is about the same, the readouts, the outlets, everything is the same, 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 same. What's different is this. It requires this output choke and it requires some uh, filtering on the output. Here they have a common mode choke and a couple of film capacitors and that does add a few dollars but it's just that, a few dollars, nothing more. The other thing that's more complicated is the control circuitry. There's quite a bit more here than there would be in a modified sine wave inverters. However, when you're talking volume, all of these components put together are only going to be a few bucks. And by a few I mean like three dollars. It's very very cheap stuff. There isn't much money here at all. It's all in the power components, the assembly, this giant printed circuit board. That's where the money is. This stuff is, for practical purposes, free as far as the consumer is concerned. However, it does require design resources. Somebody has to go through, design this, test it. Somebody has to support this in the field through technical support, warranty returns, all of that stuff. There's a lot of overhead involved, and if they only sell one of these, for every 20 modified sine wave inverters, well, these are going to have to cost a lot more to make up for it. So, unfortunately, that's the state of the world, and sine wave inverters cost more, but it always frustrates me, because they really shouldn't. One more quick note on replacing these 12 transistors. It looks extremely easy to do, however, it takes a lot longer than you'd think. It's a lot more work. You have to make sure that you get the right parts. You can't just throw on any transistor. You have to make sure that they match the application. If you put the wrong one on, you just wasted all of your time. And uh, it will probably take me a few days just to get through this. I do have a full-time job. I have other obligations. I have other things that I want to do. And this video, even though it looks like it's fairly, uh, fairly quick, actually takes a while. Just thought I'd mention that, that uh, this isn't quite as quick and easy as it looks. It, there is some time investment. You have to do this as a hobby. It's, it's certainly not a money-making venture, but 